Thank you, Pastor Steve Cummins, for the introduction. I want to thank all of you for being here um, this afternoon and, and coming to support my preaching. There's several other venues where you could be listening to several other sermons right now. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate Dr. Dwight Moody and the work he's done with all the staff members, including Tammy, to help facilitate this Young Preachers Conference, this Young Preachers Workshop. It's been such a great experience, and I appreciate all of your preaching. I appreciate all of your sermons as well. So thank you. College jobs. I'm sure you've had a few of them when you were in college or right now as you're in college or maybe in seminary. And for Pastor Steve Cummins and some of the older preachers, I'm sure you can think back 40 years ago when you were in college and seminary. When I was in college, I worked as a McDonald's manager. And I did that for five years. I did that as well as went to school full time. I did my five years of tribulation period there, and Jesus has not come back yet. So I'm, I'm thinking he's coming back post-tribulation. The McDonald's that I was a manager at was a franchise. With the McDonald's system as a franchise, a couple times a year we would have a corporate audit. The corporation, corporate McDonald's, had a special person with a special job of coming to the different restaurants and doing an audit, a two-day audit of the store. They would check the paperwork, yes, but mostly they would check us for cleanliness and service times. They would time us in the drive through They would time us in the grill. They would time us on the front counter. They would time us everywhere else because speed is what McDonald's tries to be about. Looking bad on this audit would be more audits and other consequences for the franchise. These audits had scheduled dates, and because these audits had scheduled dates, we knew they were coming and we could be prepared for them to come to our store. So the days and weeks prior to the audit were filled with extra staff working extra hours to clean the store to be ready for the audit. Many times I came in extra early the day of the audit, and the closing crew from the night before would still be there cleaning. So the closing crew might have got there at 1 p.m. or maybe a little later the day before. Here it might be 4 a.m. the next day. They're still there cleaning the store. We cleaned everything. We would clean under the counter, under the grill, under the tables, under the sinks, under everywhere else. Because we had to be ready. We had to prepare the store for the coming of the corporate people. We had to be ready. We had to prepare the way. You know, there are biblical parallels to this story. In the passage we are going to look at here in Mark chapter 1, 1 through 8, we see John the baptizer, I'll say baptizer rather than Baptist, John the baptizer preparing the way for Jesus. I want to take a few moments and talk about how John prepared the way for Jesus. And I also want to show how even though Jesus has already come, we still prepare the way for Jesus' coming. How do we prepare the way for Jesus' coming? Listen and you will hear. First, let me read Mark 1, 1 through 8. Mark 1, 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you. Who will prepare your way? A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region, and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals... I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mark opens his gospel with three Old Testament quotations. The first of these quotations is from Malachi 3.1. The second is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And intermingled in there is Exodus 23.20. Isaiah is the strongest quotation. Now I know as you read this, you may notice Mark says Isaiah the prophet, 
But the first quote is not from Isaiah the prophet. The first quote is from Malachi 3.1. And I want to tell you, do not be discouraged. That's not a big deal. The New Testament writers knew the Old Testament so well that they could often put several Old Testament quotations together at once. Many times, they expected their readers to also know the Old Testament well enough. But I find the quotation in Isaiah 43 particularly interesting. In the context, in the book of Isaiah, it says, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. It makes it sound like this messenger will symbolically be clearing a highway. This messenger will be getting rid of stumps and getting rid of rocks and things like that and making a type of king's highway for the anointed one, for the Messiah. I think that is what John the Baptist did in a symbolic way. He prepared the way of the Lord in people's hearts. He did this by what follows in the rest of the text. Now, the only literal example of that in our times I could think of is when a president comes to town. They might close roads. The Secret Service might come ahead of time and do a security sweep, make sure everything is safe. We, in a literal way, prepared the way for the corporate representatives at McDonald's. John the Baptist did that symbolically in the people's hearts. In verse 4, following these quotations, Mark starts talking about John the Baptist. We, the reader, don't know anything about John the Baptist. And it doesn't seem like Mark gives him an introduction. But I think these Old Testament quotations are John's introduction. John follows the Old Testament quotations about this messenger who will prepare the way of the Lord. I believe Mark is trying to say John was that messenger. Two Old Testament quotations, three total, but two strong ones are saying a messenger is going to come. John was that messenger, and that is John's introduction in the book of Mark. Mark gave those three Old Testament quotations to give a little more credit to who John was. Isaiah was known as the greatest Old Testament prophet. Inserting his name probably helped build the case that John was the messenger. Now verse 4, he starts to give some ideas of how John prepared the way of the Lord. John prepared the way of the Lord by baptizing. But John was not baptizing in a special temple or other special religious place. He was baptizing in the wilderness. But John did not only baptize. John was proclaiming a repentance for forgiveness. Verse 5 talks more about this baptism. He was baptizing in the Jordan River and they were confessing their sins. We must also do this. Too often we are taking sin out of the message of the gospel. I see it. But if we look at Acts 2.38, after the Pentecost sermon, the people ask Peter, how can we be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. That's exactly what John was doing. John was preaching a baptism, and a baptism of repentance with confession. So then we come to verse 6. I think it might be easy to come to verse 6 and think, why does it matter? Verse 6 is talking about what he was wearing. Who cares how he was dressed? But it mattered for them. It matters because I think Mark was, a trying, was trying to establish John the baptizer as a prophet. You know, Jesus said he was among the greatest of the prophets in Luke 7.28. For Mark's Jewish readers, they may recognize this type of dress, this type of clothing, 